So welcome to the last seminar before Christmas. It's been a very long year and I've decided to end live with you guys a subject that is not the one that I told you we were going to be doing. We're actually going to be looking at this next image. Does that give you any clues? Looks more Indian than Chinese. No, it's the country above China. Uh, Mongolia. Yes, we're going to be looking at Mongolia. Now, what we look at in regards to Mongolia is more of the later stuff. Uh, we're not going thousands of years before BC. We're not, we're not doing that today. But I, I sat down and I thought, well, what is a subject that is very close to China and which has got lots of Chinese influences? And I thought, well, Mongolia would be, be a good place to go to. And the reason why Mongolia would be a good place to go to is that so few people have ever been there or they've ever seen anything in regards to Mongolia. And if you have been there and you know something about Mongolia, my apologies. But most people don't know anything about Mongolia at all. What we do think about Mongolia is the Mongolian hordes. And we think about the Mongolians coming over the wall into China. Or we might think about Mongolian prisoners of war being captured in the Second World War, kept in Britain, because at one point the Russians were allies of the Germans, that type of thing. But other than that, very little do we know about Mongolia. And everything that I've, I've looked at in regards to Mongolia was, was completely new on me. Now, I've, I've looked at so many areas of archaeology and, and we started then off with these boots behind me. And Keith, what do these boot, boots look like? Ooh, uh, they look like slippers to me, sort of Alibaba slippers. Well, the usual answer is, is that they look like Adidas shoes. Now, there were headlines a few years ago, and, and surprisingly enough, I, I, I looked at Mongolia, and there's so much news about Mongolia. There, there's, so, there's so many articles coming out in the archaeological press about Mongolia, and I've missed every single one of them. And I missed the headlines as I'm going to read them out to you now. Here we go. The headlines as follows. Time traveler, 1,500-year-old mummy found in Mongolia wearing Adidas boots. <laughs> now, I missed that headline. And guess when that headline came out? November the 14th, 2020. And you complete, we all completely missed that one. So let's ac ac actually have a look at the image. This, this is actually some of the, the um, paintings dating to about a thousand years ago. And we're looking at one of the great tomb complexes that we're going to look at. And there you go. Mm. Now, we, when we looked at this on Tuesday, it was argued that these are actually made out of suede. And then I argued that they don't look like they're made out of suede at all. They, they, they look, they're, they're made of hide. Anyway, whatever they're made out of, what the red and the black bands are, are actually textile. Now, I, re I started off with a really weird headline. And the really weird headline is that, what do you think about this? A 1,500 year old mummy from Mongolia has been discovered wearing Adidas boots, according to archeologists and conspiracy theories. This is proof of time travel. Now, I thought that was an interesting lead into looking at Mongolia. Hmm. Could the shoes that the mummy is wearing indicate or demonstrate that time travel is possible? We don't know for sure if the mummy is wearing or, or not authentic. You know. Uh, we don't know for sure if the mummy is wearing or not authentic Adidas boots, but the internet reacted as usual in the funniest ways and have suggested there is the ultimate indicator of time travel. But you know what? That is highly insulting. And the reason why it's highly insulting yeah. is that these boots belong to somebody who died a long time ago. And these, these boots indicate a, a skill of a, a skill of being able to make these things in the first place. So we're looking at we're looking at over a thousand years ago, one thousand five hundred years ago, 
that this person actually wore these boots and, and the archaeological array of information that we found from the discovery of not one but two bodies and, and the, the level of preservation was absolutely amazing with what they actually found. Now, the sensible headline would be archaeologists find ancient mummy approximately 1,500 years ago in Mongolia. Strangely enough, this headline is not from 2020. This is actually from 2016. So people rework these headlines and, and make them into new headlines, even though we've actually proven that they're actually from an authentic mummy dating back 1,500 years ago from this press report, April 2016, in the Siberian Times. Now, I'm guessing, Keith, that you don't get the Siberian Times. Is that correct? Yeah, not very often, no. Not very often. So when I, when I started looking at Mongolia, I thought, right, how am I going to do this? So the first thing I did was look at a table of major archaeological finds in Mongolia. Some were quite strange. Some were ones that I could really look at. So most of what we look at really dates from the past historical years. And we've got the Turkic script, which, which we do look at. And we go into that. We look at some, some bodies of, of leaders and and, and um, everyday people. We don't look per se at the buildings of the Mongolians, but I thought, well, there was just too much to look at. So that thousands and thousands of years of history, M Mongolia gives us right. an, an archeological dearth of finds. And the delight for us when we look at Mongolia is lots of the finds are being found in the modern age. So they're using modern technology, luring professionals and researchers alike in joint teams to excavate and to look at the landscape of Mongolia. Now, this is really important. The, the Mongolians are embrace, embracing Japanese archaeologists, Chinese archaeologists, archaeologists from the West and various other countries are working in Mongolia on, on archaeological secrets that are, that are slowly being unlocked. And one of the great problems that I was having looking at Mongolia was the word nomadic you would think that the Mongolians were just people who just wandered aimlessly across the landscape with their yurts, uh, with, with, with their horse uh, and raping and pillaging and all the rest of it. So that's the image that you're given of the Mongolians. But the word nomadic is not, not completely the word that we think of. The, these people were able to construct tombs. They were able to construct cities. And nomadic is, is akin to partially the story but these people was, were also sedentary they, they, they had occupation centers and when we think about the Mongolians we think about their, their con constant intercourse with the Chinese that they're, they're, they're constantly battling the Chinese they're, they're constantly going back and forth now as we look at these boots I, I let's give you let's sort of read out what this this article of the week sort of tells us about these boots so the remains of suspected female a male of Turkish origins found at an altitude of 2,803 meters in the Altai Mountains of Mongolia. Now, I apologize for the pronunciation of some of these Mongolian words because I, I don't know anyone who can speak Mongolian. I can't check these words out. So these, these boots themselves show a, a skilled craftsman at work. And when... We, we think of this locality, it's, it's in Central, Central Asia, a place called Sam Sukhobatar. This person was not from the elite class. And we believe likely the individual, the two individuals there um, buried in close proximity, a male and a female. And we, we very much have this sort of interpretation. And I'm just gonna say, I've got to tell this person, go away if everyone could have their phones off that would be greatly appreciated because I, I really uh, this is just not on I'm getting these phone calls right okay Ex excuse the apologies for that I can't turn the things off sometimes so anyway, back to this what we do see with these remains they're being they're being wrapped uh, they're being buried one individual has a bow buried with him. The other one doesn't. The other one who doesn't have a bow is actually the female. What, what, we've, what we've got is the remains of a saddle, a bridle, clay, clay vase. We've got a wooden vase, which is, which is really interesting. 
We've even got an iron kettle, the, the wonderful Mongolian uh, clothes of the age. This is what this article of the week is telling us. But back to the actual archaeology and what we can actually tell us now, after the finds have been analysed, that's what we want to look at. So what I'm actually going to do is actually play with some of the images and actually come back to these boots. It does show a high level of skill. There's the there's the there's a a, a lady there, a, a lady mummified set of remains. The hair is there, wonderful preservation. Uh, you've you've got you've got the way this is all really beautifully stitched together. And you've got lots of horse tack there as well. They actually found the remains of a horse buried as well. And, you, and that there, that item of clothing at the top left hand side of, of the image is actually silk, silk. You, you, you find in remains a comb, you find in a, a little, I, I describe that as a dagger actually, and the remains of a horse there as well. And, and look at that there. Now, that item of clothing there, which we will go on to, the, the, the name of that item of clothing is, I'm, I'm gonna, just going to make sure I get this smack on. It's, it's actually, hang on a minute, I actually had a year a minute ago. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. There's a certain name for it. There's a certain name for it. Hang on a minute. Yeah, that's right. It's a word we had to look up. Now, when, when we were doing this on Tuesday, we, we, had, to, we had to look this up. The, the, the word for that is actually a deal. That, that, that wonderful garment actually spread out there, that's referred to as a deal, a specific word. It, it's an item of clothing that you wrap around. It. It's a deal. It would have needed a belt. There's no buttons associated with it. Now, that item of clothing is rather interesting. It's been patched up, as you can clearly see. It's, it's a multi-layered item of clothing. So you've got the inner layer, you've got a padded layer, and you've got an outer layer. This, this is, as I say, known as a deal. We had to look it up. And you've got a purse there, you've got a comb, and you've got these wonderful boots. Now, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this looks actually very Victorian, the type of item of clothing that a child would have used going to school in the Victorian period. Um, and I just thought that that's rather interesting, but this dates from 1,500 years ago. So with these items in front of us, let's give a little bit more um, meat onto the bones, and that's not a pun. So the, the, the bodies themselves, these ancient tombs, these, these bodies themselves, two rock tomb, um, two, two tombs, uh, rocky tombs that they found with over 90 archeological findings were found and these finds them, these finds themselves, uh, these finds themselves. If you actually want to look at the exact locality, were found uh, specifically, not just in the Altai Mountains, but found specifically at a site known as Manyan Gad. Manyan Gad. This was reported in 2016. They were being excavated in in May 2015. So these finds have only been with us for five years, and they're still being analysed. They're still being looked at. And if they're anything like the findings associated with Otzi the Iceman from over 5,000 years ago, we're still analyzing the finds from Otzi the Iceman. And that was over 30 years ago. So there's so much we can actually learn from the remains of these two individuals. So we've got this, we've got this um, skin deal. It, it, it's actually, the, the, what is actually skin? It's a three-layered um, three um, item. And we've, we've also got a, a fur coat as well, a, a, a fur coat. We've got horse skin trousers. We've got the pair of boats, boots that you can actually see. We've got a bow and arrows. Now it's not, not a long bow. It's, it's a bow that's just, just around 70 centimeters in length. So it's a small sort of bow. We've got a wooden saddle. We've got a knife. We've got a wooden vase as well. Now these date from 1,500 years ago, from a, a specific, very active period within the, the Mongolian world. And then you've got a second tomb also being found. And the second tomb is the one that's found not with any old boots, but with the Adidas boots. Now the Adidas boots were unearthed with a woman. Now the remains of a woman, um, both perfectly, perfectly, perfect sets of remains being found. Now, it, it's said that 
these were known about in 2010, but they weren't properly excavated in 2015 when I sent out archaeological teams. With the, with the female, they, they found 71 of the objects, and they actually the woman was believed to be 30 odd years old when she was excavated. And she was found to be buried with a horse. Four deals. So she was, she like a typical woman, she had, unlike the man, had one deal. She had to have four deals. Instead of having one pair of trousers, they found the woman with three pairs of trousers, five caps, Malda Marcos as well. She's got these beautiful boots. Three pairs of boots and, and uh, socks were actually found with her as well. The horse tack, seven other items of clothing, a broken piece of mirror, knife comb, and the wonderful item of silk that you can actually see there and, and, a, and a grinding stone. So those artifacts, those artifacts found with the woman all together, we've got over 90 items of, of artifacts can be studied for decades, wonderfully preserved sets of cadavers, amazing. So let's look at these artifacts. So if we go back again, if we go back again, we, we thought, we looked at these and we sort of said, zoom in on them a bit and we, we zoomed in and we thought, right, okay, zoom in a little bit more. And we, we looked at these and we actually thought, right, that, that's textile, that's textile uh, uh, weave there. And what you can see is perfectly connected to um, the, the, the sole itself and it's been stitched in, right? And we've got this actual decoration that comes over and it, it's fa fastened. So we, we can actually see that in a moment from the other side. And I was uh, analyzing this and I actually thought there's something rather odd about this. And I actually started to think that when you look at the other image, when you look at the other image of this, that actually looks like the back of the heel. So the person's being buried with this and, and the flesh is, is really well preserved. Um, and a wonderful artifact. And then somebody came in and said, this is suede. And I thought, no, uh, it's, 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 it, it's, um, I, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's a really, it's, it, it looks like it's, it, it is actually made of um, cowhide uh, rather, rather than it being a suede itself. But anyway, so if we, if we look at the, if we look at the hair there, she's absolutely perfectly preserved and we can we can get dna from this and we can work out a wonderful reconstructed profile you can you can see the nose is actually uh, well preserved there as well and you can see the horse tack there as, um also these are all the items buried with the lady and you can actually see that silk garment probably one of the one over 1500 years old that silk garment itself is, is probably one of the best preserved or well, oldest best preserved silk garments ever found. And you can see the, the extraordinary level of preservation. This could, this could keep somebody going for, um, somebody could write um, a, a scientific paper on, on this horse tack alone. And the horse is obviously the lady's love of, uh, love of her life. We're not sure whether the horse was deliberately killed to be buried with the lady concerned with these items, but it it was it, it's it may be thought that way. And look over there, you've actually got um, stirrups. So you know we've got evidence that they were using stirrups at this point. The the idea of the stirrup itself is coming from these people from Mongolia. These waves of people who are actually coming into Europe. They 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 they're giving us. Uh, their their knowledge of horse riding and this is why um, the, the Mongols were actually really good in, in battle in regards to their horse because they had developed this over a period of time and you've got the comb there so these items being buried with this wonderful lady in the forefront and you've got one of the deals there and again I, I, I love the idea that it's been patched up and you've got the, a purse there as well and when you think about this as well, if you, if you want to put this into a bit of perspective, we need to look at another burial that is being, the person's being interred at the same time. We think of the Sutton, Sutton Hoo burial. Now we think of the Sutton Hoo burial of around the same time, roughly, it's it not, it's, it's a bit, um, 
it's a bit newer than 1,500 um, years ago by about 100 odd years. But contemporary, it, 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 it sort of, you look at Sutton Who and you look at this and you think about the different types of things people are being buried with. When you think, I, I, know, I know the warrior of Sutton Who is believed to be a male warrior, but we do actually have two burials here. So where we look at the male warrior being buried at Sutton Who with a helmet and, and a shield and, and, and a purse and, and, and lots of gold and so on, these, these people are being buried with, with very different items. And, you know, the, the weapon of choice is a bow and an arrow in regards to the male. And the, the item of conveyance is in regards to a horse. But when you look at the Sutton Hoo burial, you look at a shield and a sword and you actually look at a, a ship. So, so those, are the, those are the comparisons. And when we look at the, the evidence in Mongolia, instead of this being excavated in the late 1930s in regards to the Sutton Hoo burial, this is actually being, the, the items are being interred uh, it, um, with, there's, there's lots of differences. And it, it, gives you a, it gives you an idea of the differences in culture. Look at that again. It, it, it's absolutely fantastic, the, the level of uh, preservation there. And again, we don't see anything like this in this level of preservation. And in, for, for quite some time, if, you, if you're looking at anything like this preserved in this way, you might go to bodies found in the ice in Antarctica and the Arctic and they'd be closer in time. And that's where you see similar levels of preservation. And look at, now when, when I referred to this as being a dagger uh, on Tuesday, I, I was sort of corrected. And you've got the scabbard there, a nice little wooden scabbard, two pieces of wood put together, bound with a bit of leather. And what you then see is um, a knife more than a dagger. You couldn't use this to attack somebody because it, it, it doesn't have the guard on it, for example, to stop it, your hand slipping and going onto the knife. So I was corrected on that, but again, it's, it's, a, nice little, it's a nice little tool to actually find. And the, the, level of, the level of preservation with the iron. Whoever, whoever's got their mic on, can you switch it off, please? Good. Hang on, I think, we, I think it's Jane. Thank you, it was Jane. Naughty Jane. And what, what I was looking at this and actually thinking, well, you've got this nice bone handle and you've got the blade itself. It, the blade itself looked like something that my grandmother would have had in a drawer uh, 20 to 30 years ago. It, it looks that my, my grandmother still had bone handled um, stainless steel knives in a drawer. And that's what that reminds me of. But then again, that's that's over 1,500 years old. And, and I just think, if, if, it, if it works, it, the design doesn't need to change. And obviously different, different continents as well, that we, we see the same types of things being used. There's another image of it and really fine state of preservation. Now I was, I, I was reading headline news, I think it was in the week, and it said something like, oh, bit, bits of wood from a sarcophagus found in, in Northern England from an expedition in the 18, um, 1860s or whatever, uh, um, most important find found in decades. And I'm thinking they're bits of wood. And I think this is actually a, ni a knife in its scabbard, ready to go. And I'm thinking th this, is, this is a type of stuff we should be seeing in our, in, in our headline news, but we don't see it. This is one of over 90 odd artifacts for two individuals. And I'd love to see more of this from places like Mongolia. And it makes you think, about what's out there to be found and discovered and to be interpreted and to be researched. What more is in laboratories for us to think about and see? And I'm hoping over the next few months to find more of, of these types of locations. I actually want to turn to Africa in the next um, few, few weeks actually, um, and actually see a lot more. Look at that there, you know, these being found as well, these stirrups, and, and you're thinking, well, it, it's, it's absolutely amazing that you, you're finding these. And again, put the date in there one, over 1,500 years ago. They look like they were made yesterday. The iron still looks very fresh. In fact, 
In fact, if, if, you, if you go to a farm and you're looking at the, what they're using, the, 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 um, the tack and all the rest of it, and you think, oh, would you use something like this? They'd say, yeah, I'd use something like this. But again, the date, again, something like this, the way this, this is, hasn't really changed its form. You can imagine a blacksmith creating something like this. And that's the other thing as well is the word blacksmith. I, I, I mentioned the word blacksmith. And you're thinking, well, to have a blacksmith, I would think you would need people living in a set area. Because with a blacksmith, you need materials. You need to have a set furnace. And you need to get the temperatures up. And you need to be able to make this. You can't do this wandering around in yurts. I could be corrected and somebody could turn around and say, of course, you can set up a blacksmith furnace in the middle of nowhere and, and so on. And I'm thinking, well, I don't agree with that. I, I, you know, I know today you have portable farriers with their little furnaces in the back of their van. But portable farriers in the back of their van, you need a vehicle and you, you need all the um, you need you need argon gas and all the rest of it. So you need to be set in one place to be able to create what we're seeing. Jane, Mike. Sorry. Jane, all right. It's good to see you, Jane. Hello. Hello. And I got to be honest with you, it's amazing Chris has joined us because you wasn't going to join us until the afternoon. <laughs> so anyway, boots, boots. Back to these boots. Thank you, Jane. Now we, we're looking at the other side of these these wonderful boots, and you can actually see you can actually see the design there. And it's very highly insulting to actually say that the, whoever wore these was actually a time traveler. The, this was somebody 1,500 years ago. And we actually looked at, we actually looked at the, the wonderful copper uh, design of these fastenings on this little leather belt around the ankle. And there's, there's no buckle there. It's actually slipped over. You can actually see where, it's, where you've got this, this nice little bit of leather it slipped over. I, we, we had a little discussion on Tuesday and we, we, I, asked, I asked the question, well, what is actually going on there? Is it, is it needed to keep the boot on uh, or is it needed just for decoration? And I, 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 I was of the opinion that it was needed to keep the boot on because when you've got boots that are rather big, sometimes the boots can slip off or, or <coughs> the socks can come loose and so on. And then we one one side was saying actually they look like they're for decoration, but whatever they are for, these people created these things. And and I think the wonderful design there again, um, um, Turkic design. That, that's that's the native people of Mongolia, the, the Mongolians. And you've got the nice little studs. This would be at home. This would be at home with a medieval rider from the 12th, 1300s in Britain rather than from Mongolia 700 years earlier than that. And there's the skeleton, it, very, very well preserved. I, I know it doesn't look well preserved, but for a skeleton to have, actually have the flesh still on the ribs, that, that's quite extraordinary. And as they're excavating, there's her, as I've referred to it as a dagger, there's her knife. And you, you, you've, got, you've got the tender touch that you can actually see you're looking down and you can actually see uh, the, the little um, phalanges there, the, the finger bones, and, and they're there and you can see the nails. I, I, I think that's, that's a nice little tender image. And look at that there. Now, when we looked at this on Tuesday, I, I, I thought that, that the, the embroidery there is, is, is second to none. Look at the design there. And I just thought, I looked over and I thought, this is going to be symmetrical, isn't it? And I and I and I looked over it and I and I and I I got really interested in in something else. And you'll spot that there's something else in a minute. You can see it on the screen now. I thought, right, this is going to be symmetrical. You can see that that there, that's symmetrical. And this design then repeats over here. So for a purse or a hanging for a bag, this is this is two-thirds of it. And then I looked and I saw these eggs. And this is what ate away at the rest of the textile. 
And I just thought, well, I was looking at this, and I, my, my mouth was open and I thought, the level of pres preservation is so good that these, li these li and, and we, we then discussed that they look like they could be to do with a moth. Um, and a moth's laid its eggs there, or it's some kind of fly larvae, and it's and eggs, and they've hatched out, and they've eaten away at the at the wonderful embroidery there, and it, and it's and and so on. But we do actually have that preservation, and, it, and it's wonderful that we do have that level of preservation. Again, if we want to co compare it with a Sutton Hoo ship burial, again con around contemporary with this, we think. 1,500 years ago, we think, well, that's certain who, what we do have survived is all the metal objects. We don't have any, we don't have much in regards to the textile. We don't have anything really in regards to the textile surviving, but we do here. And it's all to do with conditions. It's all to do with preservation. And it's all to do with the fact that this has survived within a landscape. Across the Mongolian landscape, you do have thousands of mounds that haven't been excavated yet. And, and people haven't looted them. It's almost as if, what's happened when you've got people moving around the landscape, those, those true nomadic people who are part of this sedentary nomadic life within Mongolia, they've almost protected their history and they've said, we're not gonna dig these things up. Mind you, the levels that these finds have actually been found in, some of the burials that we look at are found about five, 10 meters below the surface. And that leads us with another thing. If they're spending weeks digging these tombs, are they actually nomadic or they actually live within the landscape, those questions. And it, it, the problem is I'm, I'm very naive when I'm looking at this because I, I've not been to Mongolia. I've never met anyone who's Mongolian. And this is, this, is tr this is new to me as well. I'm bringing you something very, very new. So, and again, look at that. This is, this is as it was in the ground. And to me, something that I haven't, to me that I, Something that I haven't seen in, in the text when I've been reading about this is I would like to know more about what it was wrapped in because what is this, what is this stuff? It, it, looks, it looks material because you can actually see fibers. It, 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 it looks like felt, yeah. It, 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 it does actually look like felt. Now, when... Um, Actually, actually, I've made I've made a slight mistake in, in my lecture now because the mistake is, is that when when we were doing this on Tuesday, somebody looked up and they 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 said that the the um, boots, they they said oh in my in the notes that I'm reading, they said that the boots were made of felt and I said that they're not made of felt they they're clearly made of leather, um and I and I said it's unlikely to it's it to be a a, a, um, a thin suede or, or something like that. It looks quite chunky, um, and I think this is where they this is where they've got the felt from. I, I think that that's right. I, I think I think that is actually felt. Yes, I I, I would say that. So, so they're, they're they're wrapped in felt, but I I haven't actually seen that in any of my reading. Wherever they read their stuff from, I'd like to know. Yeah, I I would say that that was felt. Yes, yes, felt. So if we, if we move on again, and again, that's as they, what they did, they took it to a laboratory. They didn't actually excavate it in the field. So that's as it's lit dried out. And, and the color is actually still quite radiant, isn't it? It, it? It's really, really radiant. And it would be lovely to get an idea of how that red itself looks like it could be an Adidas red on a pair of trainers. And I think this is where they get the headline news from. Again, saying that this is representing a time traveler that wore Adidas boots and have traveled in time is really highly insulting to the people of Mongolia because they were able to do this. They were able to, com com they were able to make these things back in the past. And again, we, we're looking a little bit more detail. We, we do move on to more areas of, but you can actually see you can actually, if I if I just um, zoom in on this just a little bit more, look at that there. Now, when we, again, when we look at it on Tuesday, we, we can we can see the individual strands there, and you you can see you can see the skill, and also, I do believe that 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 is the a back of the heel, and again the the, the great preservation 
of the bone and the, uh, the body tissue. And it's likely that the, the body tissue as it's rotten down is reacting with the leather and it, it's, that's breaking down. But it's a really fine state of preservation. Now on, the, on this side, it, it does actually show, show a little bit of a buckle there. Oh, cool. But on the other side, it, it's actually, if, we, if you can remember, it, it, it's sort of bound over. It's almost as if wrapped over on one side and buckled on the other side. And, and again, is it to keep the boot on or is it just for decoration? There's, there's that question. There, there is that question. So what we're mm. going to do now, we're going to go on to something completely different. Now, I'd like to, I'd like to mention a couple of other things. Now, when, when we do look at this, they have found very recently in 2006, they have actually found, this is for your homework, they, they have found uh, what's re referred to as the Mongolian mummified Iceman. And this Mongolian mummified Iceman was found in 2006. Now that was extremely well preserved. If you want to look that up, you can look up, up in the Discovery magazine on the internet for the article. So if you look at if you look at Mongolian Iceman, you'll you'll actually see it. Now the next thing I want to go to is these in front of you. Now, as a, what we could have done, we could have just mm -hmm. done. I could have got more details about the two bodies with with the wonderful preservation of those artifacts, and I could have gone into a lot more detail. But but I just wanted to give you a little bit more of an overview of Mongolia. So what we what we do have are these stones known as deer stones. Now, the reason why they're called deer stones will become evident and apparent. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom directly into this deer stone. There, there are 1,300 of these deer stones that we know of. And these are actually carved out of granite. Now, OK, being carved out of granite, we don't have the same problem with like Karnak trying to work out how you carve out of granite. They, they are carving using iron tools. So what we do have here and I will, I will give you the interpretation. And the reason why they're called deer stone is, if I can um, get my annotation bar, is because you can see the, the back hinds and you can actually see the head and you can actually see the eye and you can actually see um, the, 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 reindeer, the, um, the reindeer horns themselves as they, as they curl along. You can actually see the body, and this is why they're called deer stones. And deer stones are not, not just, um, not just in, endemic for Mongolia. Deer stones have actually been found in other places as well, as far west. And I think we, we found them in Siberia. I think one or two deer stones have been found in the Balkans with very similar designs. And I'm not saying that um, people have come all the way over from Mongolia to places like the Balkans to to create these things but then again it might actually be it might actually be the case but these the, we've got these wonderful deer stones and they, they they it is the you know i i i'm gonna apologies apologize to use the word backwards you, you might think about the people of mongolia as being backwards and they they don't have a thriving world economy and all the rest of it but they do have the scientists, they, they do have the knowledge, they do have the expertise, they do have the funding to work and preserve their archaeological sites. So they're not backwards at all. They, they, they are, because they're nomadic, we think of their, they're wandering around in tents and, you know, they don't have much of a, a life and all the rest of it. But I'm told, li I'm told living in those tents, in, in those yurts, with temperatures outside of minus 40 degrees C, you you don't need to build much of a fire to keep a year warm. I'm told, from from one person who's got experience of that. So whereas we spend a fortune on a central mm -hmm. heating and we can't keep our houses warm in the winter, these people have got the skills to be able to do it. And again, more of these deer stones. Now we 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 think of the designs on them, and what this means above. So. What, what we're going to do now, I'm, I'm going to look a little bit more about, look into my text. So these deer stones themselves are found mainly in Northern Mongolia, and more, more around 900 examples in Northern Mongolia, but there's 1,300 all across Mongolia. So there's quite a few of them. Um, you could call, call them the megaliths of 
the Mongolian people from not 1,500 years ago, but 3,000 years ago. So, so these these link in with the with the late Bronze Age, Iron Age of um, the the, the Mong Mongols, but some of these are probably carved more recently because some of them look as fresh as yesterday, but they're, they're probably like that because they haven't been eroded and they're carved out of granite. Granite lasts a very long period of time. Some of these stones can be 15 foot in height. They, they can occur in small groups. Some say, um, and, and they, they're associated with burial mounds and burials. And when, when we think of the, these wonderful deer stones, they, even though one or two have disappeared, we do have lots of these deer stones as being still in situ. And there are many theories about these deer stones. Are they to do with burials if they're associated with burial mounds or are they to do with something else? What came first, the burial mounds or these stones? Deer stones um, composed of granite, local stone known as greenstone, which is, I do believe, another igneous type of rock from my reading of greenstone, um, certainly some are made of granite anyway, uh, very in different heights. The orientation is mixed, but usually the decorated face is on the east side, but they can be decorated all over. Carvings and designs were mostly, well, not mostly, the designs are placed on before they're put erect, because that's the best way to carve when, when they're lying flat. And again, going back to this nomadic thing, I, I really need to do a little bit more research on this because I'm, I'm lacking that, that data. When you're, when you're carving these stones, which is going to take an incredible length of time, are they done by nomadic people again, or are they done by people who are living, leading a sedentary life within some kind of settlement? We do actually have settlements as well. So I need to look at that a little bit more. The understanding of what nomadic need, need, means needs to be looked at. So what we've got, we've got deep grooves cutting to the surfaces, um, presence of metal tools as well. And the stone tools were used to smooth the harsh cuts of some designs. Nearly all the stones, um, I'm using, I'm, when I originally read this next line, I thought, yeah, what? Nearly all the stones were hand carved. Well, of course they were. Then I read the rest. However, some unusual stones show signs that they could have been cut with a primitive type of mechanical drill. There you go. So then again, of course they were done by hand and then a mechanical drill, primitive form of mechanical drill. And I just thought, okay, wow, wow. So, it, it, it goes on to say that what we've got is uh, initially we see lots of designs of the flying red deer. Now, what the flying red deer could represent is deer that may have been killed by the people one across this landscape, or the deer might actually represent the spirits of the past. When they go into the afterlife, they turn into a deer and they float off into the heavens and they wander around and, and so on. But designs do actually change a little bit later on. Alongside reindeer motifs, daggers and other animals are added. And <coughs> when, when we think about the, the rain, reindeer design, galloping, they're not galloping, they're leaping through the air. And you've got these great antlers and some of them, interesting enough, the great antlers on some designs hold a sun disc. And you're thinking sun disc, ancient Egypt, but nothing to do with ancient Egypt, a different period in time. But that idea of the sun disc, but it links in, it links in with the study, greater study of these deer stones in regards to what we know about shamanism. And shamanism and the deer images also appear to be looking in regards to representing a warrior. It might be that a, a reindeer design may have been placed onto warriors and therefore representing the warrior. The, the reindeer is meant to be a sign of protection against dangerous forces. That's what my notes say. Another theory, uh, theory as I've already mentioned, is that the deer spirit served as a guide to assist the warrior soul into heaven. 
if not the warrior himself. So again, it's, it's, it's that great array of interpretation with these stones that, that, we, that we get that interpretation. And on some of them, there are human face designs on them. We do know that the, the designs of these stones and the interpretation of these stones and the understanding of these stones, the recording and so on, has, has been going on since the 1890s. Now, this in comes the Russians. We've never brought in the Russians to any of the lectures, but today we do. Russian archaeologists. Now, it's thanks to Russian archaeologists that the Mon Mongolian people have worked with the Russian archaeologists. And it's thanks to Russian semi-Western publications that we've got to know about this land. And in 1892, uh, an archaeologist known as Radlov, a Russian, is drawing and recording these wonderful stylized images and designs. Um, and he's also seeing that these designs can be seen replicated in, in regards to the walls of tombs. And the deer itself is of massive ritual significance to these people. And again, as back as eight, eight, 1850s, there is talk of these stones and a record in these stones by, by our um, Russian counterparts. So I could go very much into this and I could talk and talk about the cemeteries and burials, but let's sort of have a look, little look at these designs now without any, any, any much more. And they, 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 over time, they have subsided some of these stones. Some of these stones have ended up on the flat. And later on, the standing stones take another, another appeal because what we do see replacing the reindeer designs is writing. They, they just cover the stones with write, writing, a Turkic script, Turkic script. Now we do know, we, we do know at least 1,500 years ago, they, they've got a written language, a, a very fine, intriguing written language that's very runic. It, you you look at the, you, you look at your eyes and and, and and sort of and you think ah actually but we're, we're not doing that we're still on these deer stones from three thousand years ago so what you can clearly see is uh, as with with some of the designs and I think what this is 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 a bit of a random sort of portrayal of of what you can find on these stones so you can actually see uh, the uh, reindeer red deer. You, you can actually see it lo almost looks like wolves in the in the, in the lower um, right hand side and you it looks almost like a boar there so you've got these various different representations and I, and initially when I looked at these I, I just thought I I, 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 I just thought could, could these are, are these actually am I reading this right are these actually 3,000 years old and maybe they could be lots of these. And the designs are very, very fine. And it, it's a, it, they, 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 they love their reindeers, don't they? You can, you can obviously see it. And they're very important. And, and what, what we could think of when we are thinking about the, the significance of the reindeer to these people, we could actually look at the significance of the horse to us at the same time. So if we're thinking about 3000 years ago for Mongolia, we, we can think, well, what was important to us back then was the horse, where we see the representation of Uffington horse, for example, 3000 years ago. Their, their love is the reindeer in Mongolia. So we're obsessed with the horse, they're obsessed with the reindeer. And it's, there's, the, the meanings are similar in a way that the importance that we behold on certain animals within our landscape through different cultures throughout the world whole collections of them and it's you, you look at this and you actually think well is that one on the left there is is that properly genuine or is it just the stone that is carved in and whatever the designs on the other stones are a reindeer as fine as that one and you can just make out the ones on that one and I believe 
they're, they're obviously going to be colouring these in as well. And the other point as well is, as, as you carve through granite, if you've got the original surface of granite, the patina on the surface of the granite is going to be in contrast to the freshly carved carvings of the reindeer. And that's where you're going to get contrast. So you're going to have the lighter colour of the reindeer and the dark colour of the outer patina. And that's what might be happening with that wonderful one sticking out over um, where my cursor is there. There it is. Actually, I, I'm thinking, yeah, that's the same one, yeah, a different angle. And th th there's arrangements of circles of these. And you can actually see what I'm talking about with the granite there as well. You, you can clearly see the lighter shade and the darker shade of the, the exterior face of the granite. So, uh, or it's, it's the way the granite works with with the patina in and so on. Need a geologist on board to interpret that. But again, what you've got, you've got this, this mirror or this disc, this disc, and you've got these reindeer designs sort of leaping um, into the air rather than galloping. Looking at that again, this is this is why I'm this is why I'm saying this is this is why I'm saying about the, this sort of greenstone. I think this is this is actually the greenstone rather than the granite, and you can really make out that this is really artistic, really really artistic. And if we get the cursor in there, you can see the body of our beast, and you can see um, the the the, uh, the the front and back hind, and you can see the. Uh, the reindeer horns there and you can see the disc and you can see repetitory over and over again. When I'm saying horns, I actually do mean antlers, but um, there you go. I know Kathy was shouting at her screen at that point. Again, looking at this. And if all of these do date from 3000 years ago, again, it does tell you that these people have revered these sites for a very, very long time. And there's the disc above there, a nice design of the disc. And I'm looking at these and I'm thinking, I, 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 I've just suddenly realized something. I, I'm just thinking <coughs> these are very Nordic in, in outlook. These are very Scandinavian in outlook. And obviously, when they're producing similar types of art in Scandinavia, they're producing it about a thousand years later, 1,500 years later. But again, these people have got really no links, but it goes to show what human minds are capable of in different areas of the world. They, they produce the same things, this, this sort of sense of humanity. We, we, are, we are all sort of, we are all wishing to prescribe to the same ideals in evolution. And we can see that in regards to our two different areas of the world and they're producing different things at different times, but more or less exactly the same. Again, looking at these and when, again, when you look at the designs on the bottom, the, the Chevron type designs, it, it, it almost looks native American as well. So, but obviously there's no, none of those types of influences. The next site, but before we go to this site, we can actually see lots of these stones are laying flat and lots of these stones are laying flat due to the fact that they have, they have been taken out of their sockets and the site's been excavated or they were found laying flat. You can clearly see breaks on this. So there's 14 standing stones here. We've gone onto a completely different site now as well. Again, a different type of carving, a different type of burial, burials in the middle there. And let's move on. Let's, let's, let's tell you what we're, we're looking at. And if it's, I'm going to go with my notes. What, what we do see when you, when you do research into Mongolia, you, you see lots of headlines like inscriptions of Yanran. There's, I haven't got an image of this because the images that I were looking at were, were really poor. And I just thought, I just can't show that because you can't really see much, but what they've got is there's a place known as Mount Yanran 
and as an inscription composed by the Eastern Han Dynasty Chinese historian Ban Gu and carved by the general Du Xiang on a cliff in the Yanran Mountains. And it basically describes a victory in 89 BC over the nomadic Hunan Empire, the Mongolian Empire at that time. It, it, it mentions that, and that's, that's basically um, within the landscape of the Gobi Desert, central part of Mongolia. And the Yanran inscription, so if you can look that one up and get better images than the images that I've actually seen, that would be great. But the one point of actually mentioning that is that you've got, you, you've got waves of action between the Chinese and, and the Mon Mongolians over time. They're going back and forth. They, they're, they're fighting back and forth over this territory of, of, of Mongolia between the Chinese. And at one stage, I, I can, I've got a map in front of me that the Chinese people had conquered most, if not all of Mongolia and went all the way to the North. And then the Mongolians found that their feet and they were fighting back and forth. So that, that's that. And the other, the other thing I, I want to mention is a, a, another more recent find. So the, the Yanran, inscription that I've mentioned I'm, 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 if I can give you a date when that was actually found if I if I can find that one I, I didn't actually look that one up in my notes too well oh yeah that that was found in 2001 so again a very recent find so that was Yanran the inscription of Yanran and then then in 2008 they they found an extremely well preserved flat harp which was made of birch and that was found in 2008. Again, I couldn't find an image of that at all. So that's the Yat Yatgan, the Yatgan harp. So another little bit more research on that. And there's another great inscription where there's another inscription being found. And um, this records a great battle between the Mongols and the Tatars and the Chinese. Um, this dates to about 1191. That's another one that's been found known as the Halgan inscription. So lots of inscriptions, but we're back to another set of inscriptions in regards to this image in front of us. So I'm just going to take a slip. We may actually have a break in a moment, actually. Turkic period inscriptions in Mongolia. Turkic, T-U-R-K-I-C, found at this site. The Dongonshia site. Now, I haven't actually shown you many maps today, but what we've got is the Dongonshia site um, in the eastern part of Mongolia. And this is where they, they've been excavating. And they, as I said, they've been excavating here very, very recently. And they, they, they've sent out a team of excavators uh, 2015 to 2017, a joint team of people excavating. And probably what I want to do is actually go to an article of the week that I've dug up and probably look at this article of the week and then do a little bit more about this site after the break and then continue on a little bit further. So article of the week, let, let's, let's look at this little article of the week from 2017. And the headline news is as follows. Ancient monument in Mongolia reveals a 1,300 year old Turkic sarcophagus surrounded by 14 inscribed stone pillars belonging to an emperor's right hand man, Dogyon Shia, Mongolia, Eastern Mongolia. The pillars were covered in Turkic runic script. The word runic there, when we've got Vikings using runic script, thousands of miles away. Again, there's no link. Turkic runic inscriptions known as tamga or signs. The site belonged to a viceroy, Yabgu, the highest ranking behind the emperor. The official served during the reign of Bilgar Kwakhan in the 700s, 700 years AD, so 1,300 years ago. A strange stone monument has been discovered by archaeologists at an ancient site in Mongolia dating to 700 years AD. Now I think this is absolutely amazing that not only have they got this this wealth of archaeology 
they're excavating, that they're getting all the scientists in, that they're using modern technology and they've got the state of the art dating technology. This is so absolutely amazing. So hats off to the um, um, Mongolian government for this. Uh, so experts have found a sarcophagus surrounded by 14 pillars, each of which covered in a mysterious Turkic runic in, in set of inscriptions. So I do believe if we move on a little bit, we've got a bit of a reconstruction. There it is. They're, they're, they're showing a Dongyu Shio site. And that is basically what it looked like. And wonderful inscriptions on there. And we do see the stones there today. And we do see the burial, a wonderful burial. And as if we go, go to the notes that I've got in front of me, the ruins were discovered in Dongyojiu in Eastern Mongolia by a joint team from Osaka University, Japan, and the Institute of History and Archaeology of the Mongolian Academy of Sciences. Archaeologists previously believe that inscriptions and ruins of Turkic ro royalty were only found in the western part of Mongolia, but now they're being found in the eastern part. During a three-year excavation between 2015-17, the team discovered 12 new collections of inscriptions at the site. It is unknown why the pillars were arranged in this way. The exact translations of the inscriptions has yet to be completed, but the research claims they provide new clues about how power was structured in Eastern Mongolia during this, this period of the early medieval period of Mongolia, 1,300 years ago. So Turkic script, we, we do look a, a lot more about Turkic script after, <coughs> after the break. So its location has been mentioned in historical accounts written in Chinese and Turkic dating from the period. In a written statement, the uh, Japanese archeologist on the excavation, Asawa, said this monument will reveal power relationships of rulers in the east area of the Turkic world of Mongolia and their territories, as well as the political and military relationships with the various Mongolian tribes, including the Hitan, the Tatebe, and the tribe of the Tatars, which I'm sure some of you may have come across. In addition, the arrangement of these stone pillars on the plateau will also provide important information for discussing the religious ideas and world outlook of the ancient nomads. Experts located over a hundred Tamga signs, which at the site need to be transcribed from these 14 stones. So on that note, what I'm probably going to do is I need to take a break. And that's what we're gonna do. And I gotta, I gotta be honest with you, it's, um, it's a Thursday. It's been a very, very long year and let's see if there's any questions and and me and Goff on behalf of Goff we're gonna have a go at Karen and Kathy and Jim um, and Andrea for being late today so um because we were waiting for you and and Keith was telling us some really weird stories which we didn't want to hear <laughs> um anyway Keith give us any questions uh the uh two skeletons that we found they were very well preserved was it because they were in frozen ground or was there another reason for the state you do get 1400 my you do get 1400 degrees minus yeah really no you have you have minus 40 degrees c minus 40 degrees c so and and obviously you don't have complete permafrost but you're not going to have the bacterial organisms to be able to eat away at the flesh um which we do have in the west so even though it's not um, permanent frost, you're going to have really um, good preservation of the archaeological remains. And this is what we see. Okay. Goff. Yeah, it's just great. Um, very interesting. It's only the second time since I've been attending that you've visited the Far East. So uh, it's a subject I'm quite interested in. So thanks for bringing us that. It was great. And, and, and you are right. And, and I have mentioned this before that I mentioned two things. The first thing I've mentioned before, archaeologists like me are obsessed with the West and we're obsessed with the Romans and the medieval period and the Anglo-Saxon. And, and I, I do apologize for that. 
But the other point as well is, is that I am really, really interested in looking at cultures like the Yaman and the dynasties of China. And I'm really interested in the likes of the, the, the Aboriginal uh, in Australia. So we will be looking more and you are right. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chris, um, uh, Manolo. <laughs> okay then, Chris, female. Um, <clears throat> Mon Mongolians are very fond of their horses, aren't they now? Yes. Um, were there any representations of horses on those stones or <clears throat> not, not those not the deer stones earlier on no. I, I don't think in my note if if i actually what i'm going to do that is a really really good question because i i actually did I, I did actually try to compare so we've got human faces as well later on we've got patterns we've got weapons and tools other animals now this is that's a really interesting question because it says tigers pigs cows frogs and birds and not horses but horse-like creatures uh, perhaps a fully developed horse wasn't around then <clears throat> but they they yeah, they was. did become massively important yeah the horse comes massively important in, in the later world when we look at these this wonderful Mon mongolian landscape so we'll look at that chris mail go for it it's much the same question really was this lack of any representation of horses. I mean, I know they were, were nomadic, but were they nomadic in the sense they were constantly on the move or just slowly nomadic, you know, like setting up a settlement and then moving a bit further east or west or... No, I mean, you know, the one thing you read about the Mongols is this, the vast number of horses they kept. It was about four or five horses per male um, sort of member. And that was, it was just this complete horde, wasn't it, of horses? Uh, well, that's later on. That's later on. So obviously, yeah. no, but my, my, big, my biggest problem is this, right? I, I, I struggled with the word nomadic on Tuesday. I'm struggling with the word nomadic today. It's like, it's like when we mentioned Neolithic and it's not mm -hmm. actually the Neolithic period. Yeah. We're, what we do, we, we put this umbrella on and nomadic to us means, means gypsy, means Romany. Uh, in, in, in the West, we've got that sort of, um, you know, we don't like them. Being that I'm a gypsy myself, that, um, you know, that's fine. I, I understand that. But uh, I think what we need to do, we need to ditch the nomadic word and we need to say we've got these people who who were different over different periods of time. Yeah, they, yeah. Did, they, we, they did have set settlements. They did have towns and cities. So it's nonsense to say that they were completely nomadic. This is where I've got the problem. And when, when they're... Now, it's very difficult for somebody to say to me that they, they, had, they had smithies that moved around the landscape. Mm -hmm. So every time they moved around the landscape, they would have had to have set up a kiln. They would have had to have lined it they, they would have had to have had all the raw materials. They would have had to have carried them around with them. They would have had to have had the high skills and set in one locality to make a single metal object. That's not what a nomad does. Also a bit like the Sami, you know, they were like seen, seasonal nomads. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, yeah. The Sami of South Africa, yeah? No, Sami oh, in, oh, in uh, Finland. You know, oh, they take right. their reindeers, um, you know, to different pastures. The different okay. times of the year yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah. then they may have left people behind in that locality to yeah. look after things i don't know mm. but yeah. maybe that's what what led them into conflict with the chinese because it, they they were they were roaming more than the chinese that it's just i'm saying that they, i'm i'm clearly they there were people that moved around all the time and that they had their yurts and they had a wonderful lifestyle and that was it but to, to have the culture that they had, to have set burials. Some of the burials that we're looking at took probably months, if not years to produce, mm. to create. You're not, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna have a huge um, hole in the ground, which takes months to, to construct. And I say, oh, what we'll do, we'll leave the body open in the air and then we'll bugger off and we'll come back the following year and we'll complete it. Mm. Well, the and body the would have been rotted and it would have been eaten away. So it doesn't make sense. Yeah. One of the problems you have is if you put a label on people, then it tends to bring up a stereotype view of what they were. Yeah. And that is often lazy thinking, isn't it, really? Mm. Very lazy, very lazy thinking, very lazy thinking. You know, there's, um, you know, I, when, when I was a child, we, when I was a child, I, I, you know, there were them and us. And, and now 
I, I, I've managed to my, change my mind around to being just us. Uh, but it's very hard having conversations with some people. For example, you know, in archaeology, there are more women than males in archaeology now, but, but usually about three to one. And archaeology has become a massively female dominated profession. And I, I, every solicitor I've dealt with has actually been a woman. Every barrister I've dealt with has been a woman. So the world that I've, I've come to know has been that women have an equal part to male. That's the way I see it. But I'm told that that's completely wrong. But if that's the way I want to see things, I think that's the appropriate way I see things, that women are equal to men. And it, 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 but, but when there's stereotypical things, you, you, you fall into that trap a lot. Jane. Um, I've just looked it up, I looked it up on the internet and it says, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. The earliest direct evidence of horse domestication in Mongolia dates to around 1400 BC. Mm. So that, that, for, if that's 1400 years BC, that's 500 years into the period that we're actually constructing these deer stones. Mm. So why there's, there, there might have been that horses, horses weren't commonplace if they were being domesticated back that time. And they probably didn't represent a high level of their demands within their society at that point. And actually yeah. to be nomadic, to, to be nomadic from an early stage, surely you're going to need the horse anyway. So therefore, do you know what I mean? There's these things that don't add up. Right, yeah. Pam. And then we're going to do those numpties. She's mute. What are, what are you showing? Um, try and get it clearer. It's inside out. This Historical is, Park. Right. The website is www.ipark.bj. Show it again. There? Okay. Talk. Talk. Okay. Right. You were saying about people being nomadic and the yurt type tent. And in this historical park, they had some of those. Um, they had wolves. We have got photos, but not right here now. Um, the, the felt that was mentioned. Yes, the tents were had a lot of felt to it. They were really yes. thick. They had um, skins, loads of horses, and they used to have, well, they did have in this area, it was like um, a fight, but I, that's not the right word, is it? Where they did like a demonstration and they did pretend fights with swords and shields. We saw all that as well. Um, the food, there's different types of food on stores. That was in another separate area. Um, but the actual village, this historical part, they had some Roman stuff, they had medieval, and like I say, all the tents and the yurts. Um, so it was so really what, interesting. What, what you're saying in Bulgaria, you've got like an open museum, is that correct? Yeah, why didn't I just say that? <laughs> Well, no, that's fine. Why didn't you just say that? No, I didn't know that. But, no, yeah. that's, that's great. Can I just say one thing? You've mentioned, you've mentioned, um, you know, you've mentioned swords and shields and all the rest of it. In, in, in yeah, what, wooden what, ones. Yeah, but what we're seeing with what we're seeing with these people, I've got, I've got no real evidence of massive weaponry. Right. In any of the burials, it was like a, a tournament, you know, yes. so it was to show their strength and had the clothes as well. And it wasn't just the men fighting, it was the women as well. Now that's what we like. We like to see a quality like yeah, that. It was good. Yeah, a bit of mud wrestling. Lovely. Yeah, mud wrestling, yeah. Shut <laughs> up, boys. Shut up, boys. That's, that's, you go. <laughs> that's, that's really sportive for Pam now. Anyway, go thanks on, for that. <laughs> thanks for that, Pam. You should have said the yeah, mud right. wrestling in the first place. You would have been fine. <laughs> right, so what, one thing before, before I get the uh, Chuckle Brothers on, right? I'm just I'm just going to mention a few announcements that people missed. Obviously, I'm hoping that you all had the link on Monday and you used it. Maybe some of you mm -hmm. didn't. Uh, I want oh, to yeah, mention. How do you answer questions? Hang on, hang on. I have, I'm going to I'm going to do my bit. Then you can do your bit. We're going to do your bit in a minute. Shut up. I, I wanted to mention this. So um, you, Gavin, you, you'll have a, a publication coming out in the next few days because it's been printed. 
and you'll have an events list. You'll see a number of events on there that are going to be Zoom. We're going to be having lots of walks that are going to be Zoom enabled. Uh, we've got a word of warning, as I've said. It's coming over YouTube and Zoom that, that you're, there are to be no discussions in any way, shape or form about any injections or anything because we could lose our license on Zoom. Um, so I need to make that clear. So no jokes, no nothing. Uh, I'd like to mention as well, this is the last class before uh, Christmas. But if those of you who want to take part in next week's seminar can do it on a Tuesday, you can Zoom, you can, you can do the Zoom link on Tuesday, take part. If not, Tuesday is going to be re pre-recording it. It's going to go out um, and it's going to go out next Thursday and it's going to go out via your link. So you can see the class next week. It's still going to have a class next week, but it's not going to be live. And Jim, I need to have a chat with you at the end. There's a, a favor I need and you get some free duck eggs. On that note, let's have some questions from you guys. Go on quickly. Right. There you go. Talk, ab what? talk about numpties. <laughs> no, it <laughs> takes time to switch it back over. One of the pictures. Deer are important. <laughs> Well, one of the pictures. One of the pictures on. looked like either a camel or a horse with a saddle on. Okay, well, look, we'll, we'll see, see if we can get that in the break. Okay, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if, see, see if we can look that one up. Yeah, carry on. Yeah. <laughs> one hump or two. <laughs> come on, the questions, come on. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. Is that it? Right, I'm going to take a break. Oh, I'm, I'm, gonna I'm a cup of tea. Is yeah, good. Let, let's just coffee. go again. Wait. Is it all over Mongolia, these stones, or is it just in certain areas? Yeah, it, they're, you, they're, they're centred in the middle of the, the 900 in the middle, but they're spread about, there's a further 400 spread around, yeah. And, and, we then we them about, all. and are we talking about Mongolia being bigger than it is now or smaller? Within the, uh, actually, you, some of the, my, my notes are a bit weird. It says, it says there's, there's 1,300 of them across Mongolia, but then it talks about there's, there's a load in Siberia. So I'm not exactly sure whether it's, it's, um, Siberia is a different area with these stones or it's including that. And you are really right. Mongolia as it is today is a very different <laughs> landscape than it was. There would have been no borders and all the rest of it. And one thing that Chris meant, whoever mentioned this thing about felt, which was Pam, which was a very useful thing about uh, with, with, with the tents and so on. Now, there's no reason why the person buried wasn't actually buried in some of the, the tent that they may have actually lived in. So there you go. So let's have a break. A 10 minute break, folks. Well, we've got a hell of a lot of stuff to eat. You need more than 10 minutes. <laughs> well, it's not my bloody fault. Um, Jim. Oh. Jim, darling, I'm asking you a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Jim, um, can I can I use are you can I borrow you tomorrow and, and meet you in the car park uh, at Where? the train station roughly about twelve o'clock? Tomorrow. Yeah. What's tomorrow? Friday. Friday. Oh, I'll be in Bristol Friday. The aircraft museum. Oh, you're going there, are you? Okay. I've got a ticket to go into the museum on Friday. Weird. Well, I love aeroplanes. Well, we yeah, love aeroplanes. Yeah. Oh, okay, then fair, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. I, 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 to make it. I just need, I just need a hand with something tomorrow. <laughs> Which hand? Right hand or left hand? Both. So, Karen, are you available? Uh, Karen, are you available tomorrow? You can give me a hand with something. Karen, you free to tomorrow. Me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what time? Uh, what would be best, 10 or 12? Ten o'clock, then. What are you, what are you going for? 10 o'clock. I volunteering for. Um, I, I, will, I will let you know at the end. Okay. <laughs> will she need both hands? <laughs> She'll need more than that. I'm having a break. <laughs> <laughs> One. Okay, thanks folks. We're back for the wonderful second half and we were looking at the wonderful world of Mongolia and we looked at this wonderful site with the 14 pillars. 
So we've got we've got over the issue of time travel and what we could say in regards to these pillars uh, just briefly is the importance that we see in regards to the Turkic texts within this landscape. And what we do see is being able to go between the Turkic texts and the Chinese texts, which are running contemporaneously to paint this picture of this landscape. So what, what we do have is a, a deep depth of understanding in regards to the Mongolian world before we even think about excavating it. So the site that we're going to actually go to next is Shorun Bumbaga. Shorun Bumbaga. It's a site that is painting a new picture of the Mongolian world and this site was discovered in 2011. So most of what we are looking at today has been discovered relatively recently. So let's change these images. So we're gonna come back to the, the, the script and the carvings. If, if you quickly look at the, the script that we're seeing, the Turkic script, it's this. This is Turkic script. Right, so before we go shoot Shorumbung Bung Bar, um, this is the Turkic script that we're talking about. It looks very runic, but obviously there's no links between the Scandinavian uh, people who are creating runes at that time and these people. We're sort of in the same time span. So what we now need to do is look at Shorumbung And Shorumbung is got a wonderful pres preserved tomb. Ashram Bumbaga, for those that want to know where that is, is there. It's in the north part of Mongolia. And one thing I learned with Ellen moaning every week was by saying, where are these places? There's Shurum uh, Bumbaga. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at this site, the Shurum Bumbaga, and it starts off with a load of gold coins. Shorun Bumbaga is a complete tomb of an ancient, ancient nomadic leader. And I've seen the press reports on this, but I just thought, well, what I would like to do is go directly um, to what I've got in front of me. So the site of Shorun Bumbaga was being excavated by a Mongolian Kazakhstanian uh, joint team. So there's lots of spread of experts over this landscape, uh, lots of mutual interest archeology. span Everybody's in it for the archeology. span Discovered a complete tomb. Yes, a complete tomb, underlying complete tomb of a great leader or an aristocrat, somebody of great importance to the tribe that lived within that landscape. And this tomb was discovered in 2011. They have found in excess of 550 finds in the tomb. Out of these, the thing that I very rarely mention in, in any of my presentations is gold. 150 gold items, mainly gold coins from where? If you're able to identify these gold coins in front of us, I will be impressed. 80, 80 earthenware finds, wooden finds, bronze finds, iron finds everything found in this tomb. So this itself is the Mongolian example of the Egyptian Tutankhamun's tomb found in 1922. So whether this was a king, an aristocrat, or, or quite somebody of, of really great importance, what we found was this cremated remains stored inside a silk bag. So silk again mentioned again. Obviously along uh, go, going along those, those great trade routes, all this exchange going back and forth between East and West. It is almost certain that this individual aristocrat being somebody of, of great importance, we know is of great importance because they actually found a gold crown associated with them as well. And this was found intentionally broken next door to the silk bag where his mortal remains had been placed. 
cremated remains. So this tomb clearly represents something different. It represents the interchange that the people of this landscape had with the East and West and the extensive trade routes that actually then existed. So all the evidence tells us that this tomb dates from around 600 years AD. 600 years AD. And we know that the gold coins, some of the silver coins and the bronze coins themselves, all placed in a silk bag, wrapped in silk, many of them came from the empire of Byzantium. In fact, these gold coins in front represent the heads of emperors of the Byzantine Empire. So we think about the West, we think about Mongolia, we think about the ability to these finds to move over with all that sort of trade. The other thing was some of the coins, they, they actually had little bars put on them so they, they could actually be used as ornaments as well. So when, when we think about this, we, we can see where you've got, you, you can see where this, this sort of nomadic trade type things come, comes into it and this great relationship between East and West. And these weren't mm -hmm. coins that ended up there because of some kind of battle. They ended up there because of some kind of extensive exchange. And this tomb tells us as much about the world of Mongolia as the tomb of Tutankhamun tells us about ancient Egypt. It's likely that the archeological evidence within this tomb, and I'm obviously finding more out of the fact, the archeological evidence within this tomb could really open the box a great deal more. Um, I'm looking at this and, and I think the point I'm trying to make is that I've never heard of this tomb that was discovered in 2011. I've never heard of it. I've never heard of the importance of this tomb. I've never heard of the fact that it was intact. I've never heard of the fact that it, it tells us everything about the trade routes. I, I, I didn't, I, I wouldn't have known or heard of the fact that the people of Mongolia were, had extensive trade links, really prosperous trade links with the Byzantine Empire, all of these things, and, and, and the perfect level of preservation as well. So when, when I look at these images, you, you see that there's not only do we find gold. Now, th this, this really opens, opens the pages of another book, because not only do we find gold objects, we find wooden objects perfectly preserved. Usually in archaeology, what you find, you find some objects that are really well preserved and other objects that are not. Again, Sutton Hoo, all the metal objects are perfectly preserved and, well, really well preserved. And, and then the organic objects have just dis to completely disintegrated. Around the same date as well, this, this is a bit younger, but by a hundred odd years, or around the same time. And you, you look at the, the wooden objects and they're really well preserved as well. So you, these golden objects shining. X never marks a spot, but in this example, it does. Now look at that there. An actual door into the Shuram Bambagar tomb, perfectly preserved. A door, a wooden door. And you've got, you've got the, the golden, you've got golden plates where, where the handle is is put into place and you've got the wonderful iron studs there and I, it doesn't it doesn't actually tell tell me what timber that is but it's great that a door <coughs> opens into another world and gold is actually shining at you straight away so i think that's something and i think it's also something that these tombs are still there today and there's many to be found and the scientists associated with the mongolian universities do have the skills, they do have the science, they do have the preservation methods, and they have, ev they, they're saying, come on over, look what we've got, come and take part in our history. And I think that's great, because they're, they're trying to say, look at our history as part of the world, we want to give it to the world. And 
this painting from 1,400 years ago. And not the figure of the gentleman standing there, but the horse itself. Anatomically, that horse is absolutely perfect. It really is perfect. And you've got this wonderful, wonderful mane. It's a really chunky horse. It's not like an Arabian. It's more like a really large um, stocky cob um, with, with, with thin hair. It, it looks a bit like a shire. It's a mixture of all these different things. But these are the glorious horses of the horsemen of this nomadic, sedentary, um, mongoloid world. And, and look at this. You, 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 they, they go into this tomb and they, they see this serpent dragon with his one, his one leg stretched out. And you can see the flames darting off into the distance. And this is before they've actually started conserving. This is, this, this looks like a faded image, but as they, as they, as they started to clean, the colors start to come out. And little miniature figures is great, isn't it? The, these, these horsemen, they love their horses. They love their representation that they're able to move around. And maybe replacing the word nomadic for their ability to be free and to be able to move around if they so wished on the backdrop of the towns and cities that they also created. And you, you've got these little figures in the background there and you've got these horsemen and this is how they're being excavated. And you can imagine going into this tomb and seeing these figures and just one of those figures on, on a horse would, would keep me going for a year. I, I, I studying something like that, it, it, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And and as as they go down, they walk into Shrum Bambagar, they, they they walk in there, they it's it's it this would have been backfilled, and you can see that they've got a nice little roof on it as well. So they're able to excavate and they're able to get their experts. Another serpent on the left there as well. They love their serpents. And if you want to think about Chinese and you want to think about Mongolian and, and you want to think about sort of Japanese culture. You, you start to see that the, the representation of the dragon is very, very important. I mean, would I have thought that it was important to the, Mo the Mongol people? I would have said I didn't know. So again, this is showing you a little bit of a map. It, it's um, that, that smaller scale map. It gives you, it's showing a little bit further south of the border where the little yellow pin is there. And there they are. So what, what, they're, what they're doing, one thing that I've been involved in conservation is one thing you don't use in conservation is water. It, it's, it's usually good to use um, something like olive oil, or something, something non-scientific, just not use the chemicals. But what they've done, you can see the horses being revealed on the left, the mane and the head and the harness and everything else is coming out there. And they're working on this and it, it's it's another world. It, it's going into another world. I knew nothing about this other world up until this week. I really didn't. And there's a team, excavation team. Um, and I, I like the fact that they got blow up yurts. I I love it. It's it's great. Blow up yurts. May, maybe I'll tell you what. If we if we ever had a conference and it needed to be outside, we're going to get a blow up yurt. It would be great. Love it. And there they are, experts looking, and and they're gradually revealing what's there, masked up. The the one thing these people know, right? They know one thing: moisture and bacteria can destroy the images that they're looking at. And they're all wearing masks. They're not wearing masks because there's some kind of bacteria that's going to kill them. They're wearing masks to actually protect the the paintwork and the, the, the wonderful frescoes that are there. And, and the figures are actually slowly coming to life. You're never going to get the the ochre, the the sort of deep manganese to, to of oxides that they're using. I'm not sure what paint they're using at all. I really don't. But I'm just presuming they're, they're using a base um, pastel type um, paints. And you, you're seeing that there and gradually but slowly the images are coming to life and, and they're telling you of a world 
that I'm sure none of us have seen before. And this is after conservation, very, very clear. So I know we were talking about horses be beyond, but when we're talking about the deer stones, we were talking about 3000 years ago, not, not here, which is 1,400 years ago. So obviously they've got the horse and the horse is very important to their society. And I think the key to maybe one or two of my questions today is why, why the horse becomes so important to them. Is it because they needed to get around? Is it because they, they, they've got extensive trade routes? The importance of the horse. Some societies didn't have an importance in regards to the horse. And I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. When we look, for example, about the Roman Empire, the horse was not that important to the Roman Empire in the early ages. When you see the Romans get into trouble because they don't have a decent cavalry and the Romans had to turn to Easterners for their cavalry because they didn't put an importance on their cavalry. One of the downfalls of Rome could be the fact that they didn't have a decent cavalry to deal with horsemen from the east. That, that's, that's one little bit of a factor there. But these people saw the importance of the horse and the movement movement with the changing conditions and everything that's going on. So um, we've looked at we looked at Shuran now. Now what I'd like to do is the next site to look at today. The next site, the next site brings us a Russian archaeologist. A Russian archaeologist. Now what we do see is a site known as um, Noyon um, Ula or Ul, uh, depending on which text you actually look at. Noyon, Noyon, we'll call it Noyon. Noyon. And this is in, um, this is on the hills of northern Mongolia. And this site was originally worked on by a Russian archaeologist. So this is more or less in a, in a great northern region. And what we do see is the site being worked on by Paitar um, Piotr um, uh, Kozlov, uh, Peter, we'll call him Peter Kozlov, Peter Kozlov, a Russian archaeologist, and he was excavating in there 1924, 1925. And then I went off on a bit of a tangent. I went off on a bit of a tangent because I was very confused with a Soviet Russian archaeologist working in Mongolia in 1924, 1925. I'll tell you why in a moment. So the, the, he was excavating in an area where in northern Mongolia with, 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 with the border between Russia and Siberia, he was working in that area. Um, there was 200 large burial mounds and he was excavating on some of these burial mounds. The reason, and and the, lots of these burials were from the years after the birth of Christ, so about 2000 years ago. And the reason why I had a problem with this is that the artifacts ended up in the Hermitage Museum and if I'm right in thinking, the Hermitage Museum is either in Petrograd or, or Moscow. I didn't, didn't look that one up, I can, which I can quickly do now. The Hermitage. <laughs> uh, to totally wrong. It's in Petersburg, yes. Yes, that's right. I, I got that completely wrong. So lots of the artifacts from the excavations. You have obviously been there. 1924, 1925, the Hermitage Museum. So he's excavating. The reason why I've got a problem with this is that um, all my all my knowledge about Marxism and Leninism and uh, Stalinism is that it, it's it's going back to year zero and it, it's going back to everybody having equality, everybody starting again and so on and so on. Um, and I, I just thought, what are Russian archaeologists doing working on remains of another country that don't fit in with the narrative of. Russian communism. And I'm just thinking, well, something I've been thinking of was completely wrong because the Russians absolutely loved working in Mongolia. It, 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 was, it, it was almost as if it was, it was prescribed by the state. The state wished to have Russian archeologists working in Mongolia in 1920s, 1930s, which is completely outside the narrative that I know about. So I didn't manage to get as many images as I wanted to. What you can actually see, see is two massive wheels in front of us in, in a in a burial um, and and it says that what we do have is that these chambers are actually very very deep in the ground these buried cham chambers are very very deep in the ground 
and the chambers themselves um, can be several meters in area. Th this usually about two, uh, usually the chambers themselves are buried in large layers of, of alluvial mud and, and so on. The original, the original mounds were about two meters in height and there's about 200 of them. You can see these wonderful chariot wheels in front of us. But if I sort of move on a little bit further, which there you go, the chariot wheels, thank you. And this, these are these are the areas you can imagine. You've got these here, and you've got directly into one. So even though these mounds were originally meant to be about two meters in height, the soil has been added to them over the years, um, and they become very deep, 10, 15 meters buried under the ground, the, the, this wonderful resource of archaeology, which they're actually finding. And they've been excavating there since the 1920s. How they knew to dig that deep, I, I do not know. I don't really, it, being an archaeologist, I, I'd have probably excavated there and thought, right, we don't have anything after five meters. It's not going to go any deeper. So back to the uh, Neon site. And hang on a minute, let's just, so what, what they've been finding, a lot, lots, of, lots of things, I, I can't go through all this. With the excavations of these sites dating to about 2000 years ago, they, they've been finding beautifully embroidered carpets, uh, which have been imported in. So bodies are being wrapped in beautiful carpets. You've you've got you've got the these these types of burial areas are, are mentioned by the Chinese. So it's a great burial landscape, and there's there's lots of links, lots. For example, when they've excavated here. They found fabric coming all the way from Greece. So when people have been buried there 2,000 years ago, they've got fabric coming from Greece. And not so far away, they've got silk being buried at this site as well. Embroidered cloth being buried there. Various art objects, various utensils, lacquered wood bronze objects, all this wonderful plethora of trade. It, 2000 years ago, the people of this Mongolian landscape are trading with everybody. <coughs> so the neon graves had over time, probably earth had been added to it by, by their descendants, but the landscape had been constantly flooded. So more and more earth built above them and you asked earlier on, why is there this great state of preservation? Well, down at that level, you have temporary permafrost. That, that's an anathema anyway. You have temporary permafrost. So because of the levels, you, you, you do have a frozen landscape most of the time. So this has led to the degree of the, the unbelievable degree of preservation at these yun, 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 um, neon graves. I was going to say Yomon then, Neon graves. So they were excavated by the Soviet archaeologists who proved the tombs to be an astounding piece of evidence from the Hunan Empire of Mongolia. The Hunan Empire was running alongside the great empires of China. So this Hunan Empire we've already mentioned. And back to this, this Russian archaeologist, Peter... Um, Kozlov, he had been involved from an early stage um, with expeditions in 1907-1909 into the Gobi Desert. And he had been out to areas where he had found, he had discovered the ruins of a great city, a Tangut city that had been destroyed by the Ming Dynasty in 1372. So he took his hand later on to be awarded by the Royal Geographical Society the gold medal for his work. And his last expeditions to Mongolia and Tibet, 1923, 1924, 1925, 1926, resulted in the discovery of the unprecedented number of royal tombs at Neyon, telling, telling us a story that I've already mentioned of great trade links. And again, this Russian archeologist working there under the eyes and patronage of the Russian Soviet state 
Um, it just basically opened my eyes and I've never, we, again, another thing, we never mention Russian archaeologists, but their contribution to archaeology is second to none. There are some quite big Russian archaeological names out there. So the last thing I actually want to look at is one other site known as the Orkon inscriptions. Now, the Orkon inscriptions will blow your mind. The Orkon Valley Turkic inscriptions. That's where we're going to end today. So let's just look at these images. Moving on from the Neon site, the lots of these tombs buried under two metre mounds and then metre and metre of silt and so on and so on going down there. And it's great the way that they're excavating that they're that they they, they start really wide and actually go in in steps and it's 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 good to protect the archaeologists. They say this um, two two metre wide tombs buried with like this um, little bit of a roof on it. Uh, timber roof and stones and then soil and obviously alluvial buildup. Again, look at that complicated one. Another one buried with a wheel there. And there it is, that, that's the location we're talking about. Uh, Northern Mongolia. And Jane is saying, have to go as have another Zoom meeting early afternoon. Thanks for today, Carl. And I hope you all managed um, to have a decent Christmas. See you all in the new year. Thank you very much, Jane. Have a very Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, Jane. Bye. Jane, we love you, Jane. Merry Christmas. Go so on. this next site that we're going to look at is here. So we've just looked at the Neon site. I think we can, where's the locality of this? Hang on, we'll come up with it in a minute. So these are the last things we're going to look at now, these wonderful inscriptions. Stones that are towering, that have got inscriptions all over them. The Turkic script, whole poems, whole text, everything on these stones. Um, so much information and lots of this is being um, transcribed. The Orkot inscriptions, these great stelae that they actually see, these memorials across the landscape. This is, the, the, this, this is one of two massive memorials and there's lots of memorials to do with Turkic script. These are usually being carved in about the 700 years AD and they're usually erected in honor of great Mongolian Turkic princes. And the inscriptions can be seen to be like the Rosetta Stone. There are Turkic and Chinese inscriptions on them. So in other words, if you can't read Turkic, do you can actually read Chinese like the Rosetta, where you've got three texts on it. Well, this is, this is the Red Rosetta Stones of around 700 years AD for the Turkic and Chinese script in Mongolia. So this is why we're able to, to look at this Ryth rhythmic, um, poetic passages of, of epics and stories. So this is the Mahabharat of the Mongolians. So these, these inscriptions were, um, like lots of things in Mongolia in the early stages, rediscovered by a Russian archeologist known as Nikolav Yadrinsky and another one known as Radlov. And these were being transcribed and being published in 1889 and brought to the Western world, which is great. Again, why I've not come across these things before, shame on me. The scripts follow an alphabetic rule. So we've got an alphabetic rule, but also appear to have strong influences of rune carving. So it's a mixture of um, alphabetism and you've got runic um, scripts being seen. It's saying that, it's, it's saying quite crudely in my text, the inscriptions are a great example of early signs of nomadic society's transitions from the use of runes to a uniform alphabet. And I would say, I would say that's a crude way of actually putting things, but we're, we're seeing an advanced language there uh, 1,003, 400 years ago. So these archaeological discoveries that, that we're seeing with these inscriptions and across the board today are really painted this wonderful rich landscape of Mongolia. And so just, just, just a few mentions, I'll show you a few more images and we'll, we'll finish. But the importance, the importance is that without these inscriptions, we'd, we wouldn't know as much as we do about Turkic script. The scripts are the oldest form of a, a Turkic language to be pre preserved. So when the inscriptions were first discovered, it was obvious that they were a runic um, alphabetical type of script. They had been discovered at other sites, but were not readily understood. So the scripts follow, follow an alphabetical form, um, but obviously with that runic um, carving base to them. The one you, you can actually see in front of us is that to uh, see some signs of, of 
reconstruction with it. And they, they've had a lot of uh, funding, the Mongolians, particularly from um, outside bodies and UNESCO to make these world heritage sites and inscriptions. And the influence that this, this runic alphabetic script has, even to this day, you can actually see that it's carved on the beveled edge there, as well as all the surfaces. There's some of the Chinese script associated, so you can read the Chinese and the Turkic alongside each other. And you can clearly see that you've got the runic alphabetical influence. It's read from left to right. And when you look at these stones, you can clearly see that they've been, if we put that on the flat, and we zoom in on that. We're looking at the railings, which isn't good. <laughs> Where's it gone? I shouldn't have done that because I've lost it. Right, okay, there, there you go. You can clearly see that this would have actually been carved on the flat. So they're read from right to left and in lines. And the, the, one, the one thing rather than, and, and I, I mentioned this would be really incredibly hard to read. And then somebody said, if you're on a horse, it'd be easy to read. And I think whoever said that was very, very right. There's lots of these out there. And lots of them have had to be sort of gently put together. You can't read anything on there. But interestingly enough, with the one that we've already seen, that, that huge one at the beginning, this one, can you see the carving on the top? The other one had a bit of carving mm. as well. Mm. Very interesting. There's nothing about this carving on the top that I've actually read because you can actually see some carving on the top. Very interesting that. I just noticed that I actually come into the end. And that's a little bit of a reconstruction of this Turkic script. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to call out a day now and I'm going to say happy Christmas to everybody. And if anyone wants to join us next Tuesday, they can. They We will be sending out, we'll be sending out the newsletter now, today, and the events list, hopefully to get to you before Christmas. Lots of walks and events, uh, Zoom walks for the new year. There's a new course starting with a new uh, speaker. She's called Jessica. And that'll be another evening that we'll be doing in the new year. Um, thanks for all your support this year. It's great that you've all kept with us. And from the bottom of my heart, you've, you've actually kept things going. So thank you very much. So what I'd like to ask is, are there any questions? Let's have some from Keith. Keith, keep the press releases coming in. Anything else, Keith? No, no, I've got another pile of press releases ready for you. Send them um, to me. I'll probably get them by the end of Feb. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, I'll also mention that, of course, They've never found the tomb of Genghis Khan, who, though he's not in the period you've been talking about, great Mongol leader. But Genghis, 1300, yeah. He's out there somewhere waiting to be discovered. Me and Goff are going to be out there with our trials next week. Thanks. <laughs> no, and it's Genghis. 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 Right. Uh, Goff. Uh, no questions, sir. Great. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Happy, Happy, Christmas. Happy Christmas. And let's have... The, the the bog off um, talking people uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Well, I've got we've got two questions. One is um, when you say in the Turkic, do you mean Turkish or Turkmenistan? Which which one do you want about? Turkic, no Turkic of the Turkic people of Mongolia. Right. Okay, that was the one. Neither. And then yes. the other one is that the very early stones, the ones going back to three thousand, that were concentrating on the deers, so the deer stones. And then you've got the later paintings of horses, when horses are obviously more prevalent. We're just speculating, why did they switch from reindeer to horses, given that reindeer would have probably been far more practical and suitable to the terrain and the climate than horses? Probably because the reindeer population had been wiped out with the denudin of the trees. But the uh, horse struggles with the cold and so whereas the whereas yeah, the, yeah. the deer would have been had the yes. right foods on the right you know they could cope with less food the, the, something happened and obviously we're not going to know the answer yet but that's a massive that's a really really important question deer to and that's going to tell us a lot about their nomadic ways and, and non-nomadic and sedentary and <coughs> some questions i haven't been able to yes yes you're right so um pam anything from you no, just thank you very much and everyone have a good Christmas and yes. hope to see you in the new year all oh, well. Definitely. Yeah. And if anyone if I'm not going to see anyone before the new year, I'll see you um on Tuesday or whatever. But anyway, Chris, the two Chris's forever hold your peace. Chris male first, male before female. No, no real <laughs> questions. That was a nice lecture. Enjoyed that. Uh, I I've enjoyed that because it's something new. And finally, Chris, the no, lady thank you. the last say. 
It's very, very interesting. Thanks very much, and happy Christmas to you, everyone. Thank yeah, you. Happy and, Christmas and, to everybody as well. What, before, before we finish, um, Karen, keep on there. And if there's no more questions, again, I will repeat, I really appreciated your, your support, Archaeology Company has. Lots more in the new year. Have a safe, happy, merry Christmas. Be happy, be jolly. Merry <laughs> Christmas, Keith, Pam, Chris, Chris, Goff, Andrea, Jim, Karen, and... Uh, Kathy. Kathy, thank you very much. <laughs> Merry Christmas and keep on there. Okay. Merry, 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 Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, folks. Bye. Do you want to speak to? Oh, right. yeah, I, I want to speak to that woman. Okay, <laughs> she's here. Okay. What is it? Right. right. Okay. What What I'm going to do? I'm going to end end the recording in a minute. Hang on. Stay there, Karen. Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, are you still on for any reason? No, I'm going. Thanks for watching this today. Uh, it's been Mongolia. Mongolian archaeology is a really awkward area because when when I do most of my seminars, you, you've always got something there. You know, you could talk about ancient Egypt. You know, something about ancient Egypt already. Central America. You know, something about Central America. You could talk about the Aboriginals, but Mongolian archaeology. I, I, up until looking at this. I, I knew nothing about Mongolian archaeology. And that's when you go out of your comfort zone as an archaeologist. But it's sometimes good to go out of your comfort zone as an archaeologist. And that's what hopefully I've done, done today. Anyone interested in joining our classes, there's the link in front on the screen. And if you want to make a donation, like and subscribe. Be very, very grateful. I'm always grateful for everybody's support. And... We're getting to the end of the year and have a Merry Christmas as well. And that's that's me done for today. Thank you very much. And leave comments. And always grateful for everybody's support. Just one thing, just one thing, Alva, I'd just like to mention as well. I don't mention enough either that I'm live in Chepstow. I've got a live performance in the drill hall in Chepstow and bookings via the website on the screen. So if you want to come along live to Chepstow, that'd be brilliant. Actually, we might be live streaming it as well. So if there's any type of lockdown, we'll be live streaming. So I'll be in the hall doing it and it'll be broadcast. So if anyone's interested, come and join us. We're looking at the Pavilion Cave Fake, and we're also looking at the Lost History of Cymru and this music in the middle as well. So it'd be great night. Anyway, that's enough for me. I am off. Stop sharing and a River Duce like, subscribe, even join my channel. Thank you. <laughs>